Good evening, everyone, um, as people continue to trickle in. Um, I'm just going to do a short introduction of who I am. My name is Katrina Hartman. I am a development officer at the Royal Alexandra Hospital Foundation, um, and I have the privilege of working alongside the incredible supporters of the Women's Society. Uh, it really brings me immense joy to be here before you as a member of this dynamic group. Um, we are united by a shared commitment to the vital cause of women's health at the Lowell School Hospital for Women. Um, tonight, we have the privilege of diving into a subject of profound significance, uh, one that touches the lives of countless women and the men in their lives, too, for some. Um, your presence here really underscores the collective understanding of the importance of addressing issues related to women's health, and we are very grateful for you. Um, I just want to uh, extend a warm welcome to someone who does embody passion and dedication in our pursuit for a healthier future for women. Um, please join me in welcoming Becky McIntyre from the what Women's Society, who will be leading the introductions uh, this evening. Thank you again for being a part of this evening. Awesome. Thank you so much, Katrina, for that welcome. And welcome to everyone else. My name is Becky McIntyre. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a proud supporter of the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society and so happy to be here tonight. We have so many people that have joined us and it's awesome for our first lecture of 2024. I'm delighted to extend a warm and heartfelt welcome to the esteemed co-chairs of the Women's Society. And we have a quick video from them to introduce this upcoming lecture and share more about the Society's deep passion for supporting women's healthcare. Welcome to Between Us. We're so happy you're here. My name is Rhiannon Adams and my pronouns are she, her. My name is Vanessa Lancaster and my pronouns are she, her. We're excited to be here as co-chairs of the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society. The Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society welcomes community volunteers from all walks of life to join us as we break down barriers and raise awareness and funds for Alberta's only dedicated women's hospital. A hospital that provides such specialized care as high-risk paternal care, minimally invasive surgeries, and treatment of women's cancers. Since our founding in 2017, the Women's Society has raised close to a million dollars in support of the Lois Hole Hospital for Women. Our hospital proudly cares for women in all ages and stages of life, from a land mass covering a third of Canada, and we are proud to support it. Your presence and support today helps make all of this possible. Thank you. Formerly known as What the Health, we debuted a new brand this year renaming this engaging speaker series, Between Us, Exploring the Mind and Body. Most often conversations that start with, just between us, come from a place of trust. This rebrand represents the essence of trust, where intimate and less openly discussed subjects, like personal health matters, find a safe space for discussion. We aspire for this new name to reflect the depth of honesty, intimacy, and expert insight shared during these talks by the speakers who join us. Following the event, we'll be sending out a survey via email seeking your valuable feedback. Every participant who completes the survey will be entered into a draw for a chance to win a $25 gift card courtesy of Alberta Blue Cross. A heartfelt appreciation goes out to Alberta Blue Cross for their steadfast support as presenting sponsor enabling us to host this informative series. Please join me and Rhiannon in extending a warm welcome to Alberta Blue Cross for the land acknowledgement. Thanks, Becky. Hi, everyone. I'm honored to be here tonight to respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands referred to as Treaty 6 territory. We recognize that the city of Edmonton and us, the people here, are beneficiaries of this peace and friendship treaty. Treaty 6 encompasses the traditional territories of numerous Western Canada First Nations, such as Cree, Salto, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, and Nakota Sioux. This is an important moment to acknowledge all the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. 
Thank you so much, Trish. And now I have the honor of introducing tonight's presenter and this important women's health topic that we get to chat about tonight just between us. In a recent survey by the Alberta Women's Health Foundation, 40% of women surveyed reported pelvic floor dysfunction, including prolapse and incontinence. And that means that you or someone you know and love is likely affected, yet they may be too embarrassed to say something or have had their symptoms dismissed by care providers. Tonight, Dr. May Sine, tonight's presenter, specializes in female pe pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery. She is part of a world-renowned multidisciplinary team offering surgical, uh, quality surgical and conservative care for women at the Lois Hole Hospital's uh, your, Women's Bureau Gynecology Clinic. Dr. Sine takes women's pelvic health seriously and has pursued a career with personal focus and drive to substantially improve patients' quality of life through specialized care. As Associate Professors of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Alberta and outgoing President of the Canadian Society for Pelvic Medicine, Dr. Sine will share her insight and expertise to arm each attendee with the knowledge they need to advocate for their own pelvic health or the pelvic health of someone they know and love. Please help me welcome Dr. May Sine. Over to you. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Welcome everyone. I'm so excited to be speaking with all of you. Tonight, we're going to talk about some pretty important topics. And before we get too far in, I do want to acknowledge that I'm going to be using gendered language. I'm going to be using the term woman um, and female pelvic health. But I do want to acknowledge that we have patients who do not identify with the term woman or may identify with the term woman and not have female pelvic anatomy. So with that, my pronouns are she and her. And let's begin. First of all, who am I? What is a urogynecologist? Well, a urogynecologist is a surgeon, a physician who has done five years of residency in either urology, which is a specialist in the kidneys, ureters, bladder, or in OBGYN, which is obstetrics and gynecology. And then after that, has done an extra two or three years to specialize in urogynecology specifically for the pelvic health conditions we're going to talk about tonight. I have to say that I work in the best urogynecology clinic, I think, in the world. I work with true visionaries and we have the surgeons who are pictured here. You can check our website. But the real important part is that we work with an amazing team of nurses, physiotherapists, dietitians, pharmacists, and front desk clerks. And we also work closely with others who are not in our clinic. And those are your gynecologists, urologists, colorectal surgeons, and geriatricians. But what is the current climate in Alberta and what's going on in Canada? Well, I have to say, having practiced medicine in Ontario, in British Columbia and now in Alberta, we've got it pretty good in Alberta. And again, I think this is truly due to the vision that certain women had years ago to start the Lois Hole Hospital for Women. Did you know that this is one of only three women's hospitals in the country? And actually, I would say the only one that is comprehensive because the one in Toronto is only for outpatient ambulatory patients. And the BC Women and Children's Hospital has a large children's hospital component. So we are very blessed to have these visionaries, including Lois Hole herself, Dr. Flood, Diana McDonald, Dr. Schultz at the clinic, who really created this urogynecology program within the Lois Hole Hospital for Women. And it is with that that we have been able to continue our work in urogynecology and be at the forefront of the country. But what do urogynecologists treat? Pretty much every urogynecologist you come across in Canada will treat two conditions, pelvic organ prolapse, and that's a vaginal bulge, and when you can't control your pee. So you're having accidents and you can't control it. That's urinary incontinence or leakage. Depending on the urogynecologist, you may have treatment for other conditions be part of their repertoire. So that might be recurrent bladder infections, 
an inflammation condition called interstitial cystitis or bladder pain syndrome, accidental bowel leakage or fecal incontinence, chronic pelvic pain or pain with sex, vulvar dermatologic conditions like skin conditions of the outside of the genital area, trans health, oasis, which is obstetrical anal sphincter injury or tearing with delivery, mesh and mesh injuries, sexual dysfunction, including libido issues, for example, menopause, and cosmetic gynecology. This is common. We just don't talk about it. One in four women are affected by urinary leakage. So if you know four women in your life, one of them is probably wearing pads and diapers and try to talk about it. One in 10 women are affected by bowel leakage. One in three women will have pelvic organ prolapse. And that again is when the vaginal bulge is coming through. Three in 100 women are affected by a condition called lichen sclerosis. And I put a star here because likely this is a gross underestimate. And it is actually an inflammatory condition of the skin that is probably much more common than this. Seven in 100 women are affected by interstitial cystitis. That's the inflammatory bladder condition I mentioned. And 16% of women are living with chronic pelvic pain. When we look at other health conditions in Canada, one in five will develop high blood pressure, one in 10 will develop diabetes, one in 10 will de develop arthritis. And we talk about these conditions much more freely. One in eight women will develop breast cancer and one in seven men will develop prostate cancer. So we can see that pelvic health conditions are very common. Okay, now let's do some learning and see what these conditions are all about. We have to start with some anatomy. Since the beginning of time, whenever we learned about anatomy in medical textbooks, female anatomy was always censored, or it wasn't really proper to have pictures in anatomy textbooks. And that actually is really detrimental to women's health today. Now, I am going to be showing both pictures and true photos of um, genitalia tonight, so please be warned that we are going to have this anatomy lesson of the intimate parts of our body. So this is actually a picture from a textbook from 1559. And you can see the torso of the male, of the female pelvis, and there's a, a huge uh, dissection and explanation of the penis. But actually, if you look at the vulvar area on the female anatomy, there is a censored little triangle here. And this continued for hundreds of years, for centuries. On the left, you will see this was from Gray's Anatomy, and this is the image of the external genitalia from 1913 to 2005. This is the extent of anatomy teaching in textbooks of the external genitalia. So we, of course, we have physicians who trained in that era who may only know this much anatomy when it comes to the female pelvis. It is only, can you believe, in 2019 that we have images of the anatomy of the clitoris especially. This was an area that was considered shameful and not to be in textbooks because it wasn't proper. So we are now having medical students learn about the entire pelvic anatomy structures of the female. Here's another um, image that shows us the importance of this nerve, the pudendal nerve. The pudendal nerve basically is why you can feel anything in the vulva and why you have control of keeping your stool in and keeping your bladder continent. So it's both the motor and the sensation of the pelvic floor. And of course, guess what pudendal means in Latin? It actually means the word shame. So our whole historical context of anatomy is tainted by not wanting to talk about these issues. So women have often gone through their lifetime just ignoring their pelvis and their pelvic floor and their genitalia and sort of created this dissociation between mind and body. But then when there's problems, what is going on? What am I feeling? This is called the Great Wall of Vulva. And this is art that shows that you can have vulva that look 
just like the noses on our face, different shapes and sizes, and they're all normal, they're all healthy. And just because that one anatomy textbook showed it one way doesn't mean there's anything abnormal if the labia, for example, are different sizes and shapes. So now that women are taking some pride and ownership and will look and understand their pelvis, how do we keep the vulva healthy? Well, first of all, you want to have cotton, cotton content, things that are breathable. So you want that material that's against your skin to be able to breathe, especially if you're wearing pads like incontinence pads. For pee, make sure you're using incontinence pads. Don't use menstrual pads if you're using it for leakage because those have synthetic plastic and can irritate the skin. Avoid harsh detergents. If you're having vulvar itching and problems, don't shave, don't wax, just clip. Hair clippers will keep the hair short and neat and not give you skin problems. This is an important point that we've always taught parents of little boys to retract the foreskin of the penis to make sure it's clean, but we've never taught young girls and women this. And so what can happen over time is that the clitoral hood will fuse and then old dead skin cells called smegma or keratin pearls can get trapped. And we see patients with pain in the clitoral area, sensitivity, or the opposite where they have no sensation of the clitoris anymore. So it's important when you're in the shower, you're gonna pull back and make sure that that skin is, is good and free. Just like any other part of our body, if you have dry skin, you probably have a dry vulva. So you use moisturizer. This can be coconut oil, which actually has some antibacterial properties, or a non-perfumed moisturizer, or a barrier cream like Vaseline, or if you feel like uh, if incontinence is an issue and you need a good barrier cream, you can use something with zinc. Of course, all of this is challenging if you have incontinence or a lot of vaginal discharge because that can irritate the skin, and that's when we want you to ask for help. I've put these little research spotlights at the bottom for research activities that our clinic is participating in, um, just to keep you up to date as to what we're doing. Let's zoom in on lichen sclerosis. So this is an inflammatory condition of the skin. I often point to my eczema in my elbow and tell my patients that it's just like that, but of the vulva. It can be itchy, it can be painful, there can be discomfort, there can be pain with intercourse or just with walking or wearing tight pants but it is a chronic condition that can be managed. And the gold standard is treatment with a steroid, a strong steroid to decrease the inflammation. And now, because it's been studied, we know that the 5% chance of this skin condition becoming cancer can actually be mitigated if you use, or decreased if you use the steroid and actually keep the inflammation down. But there's lots of other ways to help this condition. And I find Dr. Jill Kraft a reliable gynecologist on Instagram that you can uh, follow. And she has these little um, images of symptoms, but then here also therapies. So we know that inflammatory conditions can be affected by diet, hormones. There's other treatments that you can do to calm the, the skin. And physiotherapy, believe it or not, treats skin conditions too of the vulva. And so it's important to look at any of our conditions from more than just the medication point of view, but look at it from our entire lifestyle point of view. So now that we've looked at the outside skin, let's go a little deeper. Let's learn about the pelvic floor anatomy. So this is a bird's eye view looking up from above. So imagine these here are actually your hip bones. I'm just showing you with the mouse. And then all these muscles are like a bowl of muscles of the pelvic floor that are keeping your organs in. But there are three holes. Starting from the back, closer to your spine, is the opening to the rectum. And if you want to see the side view, this is the rectal opening right here. That's where the poop will come out. In the middle, you've got the vaginal opening. So at the very, very top of the vagina, you have the uterus, of course, unless you've had a hysterectomy. At the very end or very beginning of the uterus, depending on how you look at it, is what we call the cervix. And then here's the vagina, and so that's the second opening. And then the very first opening here is where we pee out of, and that's called the urethra, or the bladder neck is where they've cut it here. 
but you can see that the bladder would live here. So all these pelvic floor muscles, their job in part is to support the organs. But what happens if you have prolapse? Well, we think that prolapse happens because of maybe tearing or stretching in the different ligaments inside, but also perhaps a weakness in that shelf or that bowl of muscles. And I am going to show images of real patients now. So if you are uncomfortable with that, please, this is the time to look away. So on the left, we have the cervix coming through the vaginal opening. In the middle, we have the bladder pushing on the vagina, and that's what we're seeing at the vaginal opening. So right behind that vaginal skin is the bladder. And the reason we know that this is because here is the vaginal opening now. And then on the far right is the extreme case where the entire vagina has turned inside out. And that's why the patient has had rubbing and what we call erosions uh, from the underwear. And there could be bleeding. And that's the extreme circumstance where the person cannot pee anymore because the bladder has become trapped and the pee can't go around the corner. So of all people, we said it's very common to have prolapse, but it's actually quite uncommon to get to this last stage. It's it's less than 3% of people uh, with prolapse will get to this stage. So it's more common to have, as an extreme circumstance, the, the first two pictures where people are having quite a bit of symptoms and it's very uncomfortable. It feels like you're sit sitting on a ball. What is the best treatment? Maybe I've given you the answer with my picture. I think this is going to be one of the best QR codes you're going to take a picture of tonight. We know that for almost every condition of in the pelvic floor, physiotherapy is going to be our best tool. And so actually, the pelvic physiotherapists that we work with, with AHS, have created webinar series and education classes and online tools and uh, handouts and everything that you need to work on incontinence, work on preventing issues after childbirth. So this is a very important link that I want you all to get. Because as much as we can try to do surgery after and we can work with you on uh, finding ways to help your condition once it's happened, the best way is actually prevention. So we have to work on, do we counsel patients enough on the risks of vaginal delivery? Do you really understand and have we conveyed what it, what can happen to the pelvic floor after such an experience? But what if we're now in a position where the prolapse has happened? Well, first of all, you can do nothing. It's not a dangerous condition. It will not come out and fall on the floor. It will not become cancer. And that chance of it becoming so severe that you can't pee is so low. But if it happens, then of course, if you're not peeing, we want to see you. That is urgent. But other than that, if it doesn't bother you, it doesn't bother us. So we do have patients who will come to our clinic and will say, well, I don't feel anything, but I just wanted to get checked out. And our answer is if it doesn't bother you, it doesn't bother us. So some people do have prolapse, but they don't feel it. And that's okay because it's not affecting their function. They're still very active. They can still do everything they want to do. So it's not a medical emergency to fix it if you don't if you don't find it bothersome. But then there are people who really do, they can no longer walk, garden, go on hikes. They stay at home. Uh, they feel this all the time. And if that's the case, we highly recommend pelvic physiotherapy. So just the way there's physiotherapists for every part of your body, the pelvis is not excluded. And that one-on-one -on -one attention and care and assessment is very important. And this is where, and I will get to this, our societies are advocating for universal coverage of pelvic physiotherapy because of how important and how um, much it can change the outcomes of a patient's life with access to a physiotherapist. The next point is vaginal estrogen. We know that using estrogen that goes through your whole body, like pills or creams or patches, 
can have side effects that we have to be very careful of and aware of, and that's hormone replacement therapy. But vaginal estrogen, we finally now have study after study showing that it does not get absorbed into the body. It just works where we want it in the vagina and a little bit in the bladder. And what it can do is it just brings enough blood flow and elasticity to the vagina that that rubbing feeling that the prolapse you feel when it's rubbing on itself is much more improved. So sometimes just not feeling the prolapse just makes it better and makes the tissues healthier. This is especially important for people who've gone through menopause and the estrogen levels are lower. Sometimes we use it in people who haven't yet, but it's mostly for patients after menopause. Finally, there are devices called pessaries. A pessary is a silicone device, medical grade, and it, think about it like an orthotic for the pelvis. So it folds up and then pops open. And here are some examples of shapes and sizes. And it's like a supportive device. And some patients use it all the time. But you have to be fit for one because the same way there's different shapes and sizes of pessaries, there's different shapes and sizes of women. So we need to have a fitting appointment to make sure you've got the right fit. If it's too big, you feel it. If it's too small, it falls out. And about 70% of patients will find a good fit. And I've put a research spotlight here because this is very exciting. We're actually working on personalized pessaries, which would be a game changer because you don't have to try to fit to an existing pessary. You can have a custom pessary made. And some, some patients just pop it in before they go play their soccer game and others will have it in all the time. And some people will just pick and choose when they need that extra support. And finally, there is surgery for prolapse and surgery is a good option for some and last resort for others. And that's why it's important to have that meeting with the urogynecologist to see if and when it's time to move on to surgery. Our surgeries are not 100% because we're still leaving the vagina open. So there's always a chance that the prolapse comes back. So it's definitely a discussion to see when is it the right time for you. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next topic. I'm just having a quick peek at the chat, chat in case anything is really relevant now, but I'm just gonna continue because this bladder leakage is so common, but there's actually two most common types and they both result in having accidents, but their causes are different. So that means the treatment is different. So the first one is called overactive bladder or urge urinary incontinence. So that's when you're just like minding your own business and you suddenly feel like, I have to go, I have to go now. And then you try to rush to the bathroom and shoot, you didn't make it, you had an accident. That's overactive bladder and that's the nerves of the actual bladder squeezing before they should. The other type is called stress incontinence. And this is not emotional stress, this is physical stress. So that's with coughing, laughing, sneezing, bending. Anytime there's pressure from above, the sphincter of the bladder neck from below is just not strong enough and the pee comes through. So this one is treated differently because it, the cause is different. And of course, yes, you can have both and we call that mixed incontinence. So the treatments here are again, you don't have to do anything if it doesn't bother you. If you leak a couple of drops every few weeks and you're like, well, that's okay, then that's okay. But again, pelvic floor physiotherapy, very helpful. We know that from studies that 60 to 70% of people who participate in pelvic floor physiotherapy sessions avoid surgery for this. Vaginal estrogen has been shown to help with urinary urgency modestly. It's not like it's going to make a huge difference, but it will help a little bit. And then the lifestyle changes are huge. So this could mean things like cutting out coffee, stopping smoking, anything that bothers the bladder and there are so many bladder irritants uh, it could mean not drinking water after 7 p.m or after dinner time anymore or any liquids it could mean weight loss because we know that losing up to five to ten percent of your weight your body weight if you're obese can result in a 50 percent improvement of your leakage so there's a lot of lifestyle changes that you can work with um, to improve the leakage there's also some um, 
over-the-counter pessary options, I guess I can call them. So you can be fit with a pessary. That's job is to specifically put pressure on that bladder neck so the pee can't come through. So you put it in the vagina, it puts pressure on the bladder neck, and it stops that cough, laugh, sneeze leakage. Um, but in the grocery store, pharmacy, online, you can order something called Impressa. I think they were on back order for a bit, but it's like a tampon that deploys into this umbrella shaped thing that puts pressure. And then the Uresta is an online kit where you can order the pessaries and you have to size it yourself and find the right size for you to put pressure on that bladder neck for stress incontinence. Medications are used for urge incontinence. So those are medications that can relax the bladder. And then there's more procedural or surgical interventions. For example, for urgency, we use bladder Botox actually into the muscle of the bladder to force that muscle to relax the same way we can use it for wrinkles to force the wrinkles to relax. But for stress incontinence, we can use filler to thicken that bladder neck so that it sits more closed and there's more resistance so the pee can't come through. I have a patient who's had both and she said, well, now I'm beautiful on the inside. So we do use some of these tools to help with the urge and stress incontinence. And then finally, there's the sling, which is the gold standard for stress incontinence, where you actually have a sling inserted under the bladder neck as a support. And again, that is a surgery that a urogynecologist would perform for you. Our research spotlight here is that we are investigating whether antibiotics will decrease the risk of bladder infections after instilling Botox or injecting Botox into the bladder. Speaking of bladder infections, so common. But I just want to take a moment to let you know that if you think you have a bladder infection and you go give a sample and you're told right away if you have an infection or not, that is a best guess based on dipping your urine and looking for maybe inflammation cells like white blood cells or maybe traces of blood because inflammation can cause a little bit of fragility in the bladder and some blood will come out. But to really know if you have a bladder infection, your urine has to be sent to the lab. The microbiologist smears the urine on this Petri dish with that agar that's sweet and has sugary material in it. They'll put it in that oven and they'll wait. And so you have to wait three to four days to see the, if the bacteria actually grows. And that's the only way to know if it's actually a bladder infection because you can see the bacteria. And so they look for a certain amount in the urine and that's when you know you have a bladder infection. So a lot of times people will think they have a bladder infection but actually it's bladder irritation or bladder inflammation and doesn't need antibiotics. But antibiotics do have some anti-inflammatory properties so people feel better when they take it. But unfortunately, overuse of antibiotics can be a big problem. So how can we prevent recurrent bladder infections? We know the studies show us that you should drink at least a liter and a half of water per day. There is evidence that cranberry capsules, not juice, with at least 36 milligrams of the active ingredient of cranberry can prevent bladder infections. You'd have to drink 10 liters of cranberry juice a day, the pure stuff to get that amount. So nobody's drinking that and we're all getting diabetes if we drink that much cranberry juice. So it's the capsule that's concentrated that can be helpful. There is a product called D-Manos. It's an inert sugar. And when you take that, it can change the bladder pH in a way that bacteria don't like sticking to the walls and it actually flushes it out. And then finally, we know that if you use vaginal estrogen after menopause to decrease bladder infections, you decrease them by over 50%. So vaginal estrogen, again, brings that blood flow, thickens the vaginal walls, thickens the bladder, um, makes it more elastic, more pliable, less chance of uh, bacteria to go through little cracks. And then for patients who need more, there are prevention antibiotics. There's bladder installations where you get the bladder washed out with antibiotics. But the most exciting thing is that there's a new discovery that we actually aren't getting bladder infections, but our body has an allergy to the bacteria being there. And these vaccines that have been developed in Europe seem to be over 90% effective in preventing bladder infections. So 
th those trials are just going through Health Canada now and may be a game changer when it comes to bladder infections. I want to talk to you about this close cousin of a bladder problem that is really difficult to diagnose and treat. And that's called interstitial cystitis. It also is called bladder pain syndrome. And it's a spectrum of disease, but it's a bladder inflammation condition. And so these patients always feel like they have a bladder infection, but every time they get it checked, they don't. But they really feel like they do because they have urgency, frequency, getting up in the middle of the night, can't hold their bladder for more than like 20, 30 minutes, constantly in the bathroom. And then over time, that actually starts to become painful. Like if I don't go empty, I'm in pain and peeing feels better. There's different subtypes to why this is happening. For example, one is the actual bladder itself. The layer that's supposed to protect us from feeling our own pee is gone or there's defects in it. So you can feel your own pee. And as you know, that would sting. So that's one type of interstitial cystitis. Another type is that the muscles beside the bladder are in constant spasm. So the poor bladder muscles trying to squeeze past these tight pelvic floor muscles. And that causes inflammation and a lot of activity in the bladder. We recommend our patients check out ichelp.org. This is a American website, but it's created by patients. And it's pretty comprehensive to the different options available. So what does interstitial cystitis actually feel like? Amber says, during a flare, it's hours spent in the bathroom, peeing what feels like fire, while your bladder is spasming out of control and it feels like it's trying to escape your body. It feels like that. So the treatments we can offer are definitely a dietitian consultant. 90% of people with interstitial cystitis will have a food trigger. So a lot of people it's coffee, for a lot of people it's citrus, tomatoes, everyone might have something. And if you can do a proper elimination diet and find your trigger, you can increase the time between flares. Pelvic floor physiotherapy is huge for interstitial cystitis because over time, we wanna protect ourselves from pain. So our pelvic floor muscle will start to contract and then they become a part of the problem. So what we do is we can actually inject those muscles beside the bladder and that's what trigger point injections are. And we can do that with Botox, with freezing, or just dry needling like acupuncture, where we try to release those muscle knots. We can prescribe bladder medications to relax the bladder, decrease inflammation, or just not feel the bladder. And also we can do bladder installations that try to coat the bladder so it can heal. And there are procedures where we can stretch the bladder, we can treat any spots that are especially inflamed, or inject them with steroid. So these are all things that we do offer at our clinic. Now switching gears to chronic pelvic pain. This is the pelvis, but there's so much going on in the pelvis. You've got your uterus, your tubes, your ovaries, you've got the bladder, you've got your bowel, and of course the pelvic floor muscles. And there's something called crosstalk, which means when one organ is inflamed, and in pain, it usually can translate to the other. A lot of times it might originate from one organ having a history of some sort of condition or trauma, and it can manifest with pain with sex, pain with bowel movements, pain with peeing, pain with sitting, walking, standing, a combination, all of the above, none of the above, or a combination of some and not others. So there's a condition called endometriosis, where the inside lining of the uterus, that tissue, can grow outside of the uterus. There's adenomyosis, where that grows inside the muscle of the uterus. You could have painful periods when you were younger, or a lot of ovarian cysts because your periods were not regulated. You might have been a horseback rider, gymnast, or someone who kept falling on their tailbone, tailbone injury after tailbone injury or lots of bladder infections, or interstitial cystitis, irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, like Crohn's or colitis, or a trauma history, whether that's physical or sexual, and previous surgery, maybe with mesh or without. And so anything that started that trigger 
can start to become this cascade of the other organs getting involved, the pelvic floor muscles getting tight to try to protect you, but actually squeezing the nerves that run between them, and then nerve pain can begin. And then that's when the brain gets involved and the cycle of pain continues. This is a book that I would recommend if you're interested. It's called A Headache in the Pelvis. We know more about migraines and pains in other parts of the body, but we're only just understanding what it means to have chronic pelvic pain and the treatments. So our goal is to work with your original doctor to treat the disease of origin. So if it's, for example, endometriosis, to work with your endometriosis doctor. If the pain persists and you don't have, for example, that condition anymore, our clinic is available to everyone who has a referral from a gynecologist. And what happens is, uh, actually, first of all, only 20% of chronic pelvic pain is gynecologic because of all those other organs in the body. But then when that is treated and the pain's still there, we know there's other things going on. So we offer education classes to learn more about those. We do trigger point injections, like I mentioned, into those muscles if the muscle tension is the cause or the a big reason of the pain. We talked about the lysis, which means breaking down of adhesions, which means scarring over the clitoris. We offer a very successful mindfulness-based cognitive therapy course, which is eight weeks, where we learn about how chronic pain forms and how it's different from acute pain and which centers in the brain are responsible for chronic pain and how we can actually change those pain pathways by rewiring how we think. We also offer medical management like nerve pain medicine, muscle relaxants, and pelvic floor physiotherapy, again, so important. But for these patients, along with interstitial cystitis, it's reverse Kegels. If you're doing Kegels, you're making your condition worse. So this is why we want to tell everyone, oh, don't forget to do your Kegels. But if you just do a Kegel, 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 and tighten up your muscle, tighten up your muscle over time, imagine you have your fist and you just scrunched it up as hard as you can for years. Now the muscles in your hands, imagine how sore they're going to be. So when you every time you do a Kegel, everyone do one with me, you hold it for two seconds, you've got to release it for four. So you squeeze for however many seconds and you release for double time because we cannot have those muscles getting over contracted and over time becoming the cause of pain. And a lot of people with reverse, uh, sorry, a lot of people with pain in their pelvis it'll seem like they can't do a Kegel. And they say, oh, I'm told I can't do a Kegel. I don't know if I'm doing one. But I always say, imagine this is my bicep and my muscle's already really tight here. And then you tell me to do a Kegel. It looks like I'm not strong, but that's because it can't go anywhere else. It's already using its full contraction. So you have to first learn how to do a rever reverse Kegel and fully extend your muscle, and then you can re rehabilitate and use the entire power of your pelvic floor. So that's why a pelvic floor physiotherapist can tailor it to you. Because if you're also leaking urine, and you're like, I can't do a Kegel, it's because the muscles are not being utilized properly. They're short, they're contracted, they're tight, and you need to lengthen and then contract to use the entire span of the muscle. We also offer hypnosis therapy and heart math. So this is a very mind-body-centered program, and we also have research going on in cannabis for chronic pelvic pain, Botox injections for pelvic pain, researching the mindfulness for chronic pelvic pain. We're looking at hip injuries as a cause of pelvic pain and interstitial cystitis clinic initiative. So I've already jumped the gun a little bit about this, but it's just so important to know that um, am I supposed to strengthen my muscles or am I supposed to lengthen my muscles? Where am I? And it's pretty hard to figure that out on your own, which is why even one session with a physiotherapist, I always say, just go have an assessment and you're going to learn so much. And of course, the pro tips about Kegels are they're pretty hard to do in that moment when you have a cough or a sneeze. So you start with doing them lying down is the easiest. Then if you can you do them sitting up? Then can you do it standing? Then can you do it when you're lifting something heavy? 
And then can you do it fast enough when that cough comes on? So you can gradually get there. And for those people, when we know that they know how to do it, we can say you can squeeze and release, squeeze and release 10 times. And you try to hold the last one for five seconds. Don't forget the reverse for 10. And you do that three times a day. That's a good place to start. And of course, for those of you who've tried it, doing Kegel, uh, doing Kegels during sex can really augment your sexual experience. But if you haven't quite learned how to use those muscles, it's not a good place to just learn them. That's more for once you can do it in the moment and once you can do it with coughing, laughing, and sneezing. Here is a side view of the pelvic floor muscle. So remember the three openings, the bladder neck opening, urethra, the vaginal opening, and the rectum opening. So then they've taken those organs away so we can see the pelvic floor muscles. And so th this muscle, for example, the obturator internus is the inside of your hip muscle. It's responsible for when you make your knee go away from the body. And so this is the muscle that's right beside the bladder that when tight can cause a lot of problems. And then here are the other muscles in the pelvic floor that if too long and more on the loose side can contribute to prolapse. So we've got a spectrum of conditions here. And when we do our trigger point injections, we go into those muscles and actually release the muscle knots. You all with me? It's a whirlwind, but we're having fun, right? The last topic we're gonna to cover tonight is fecal incontinence. This is also called accidental bowel leakage. A very common cause for this is an old injury from delivering a baby. So whether you had to have an episiotomy or there was a tear that went all the way to the anal sphincter causing weakness, that is the most common. And you can think of the anal sphincter as a donut muscle and when there's a tear from the vagina, the muscle might sit like this. And so when it contracts, it can't fully utilize the entire concentric force of keeping your poop inside. A lot of times patients will have this happen after delivery and then it kind of goes away and they think, okay, I'm fine. And then after menopause, it comes back. And that's all, a lot of times because maybe the low estrogen but also maybe all the other muscles that were compensating for that one sphincter muscle have become weaker over time. The same way that if we don't keep up with our exercises and our um, muscles at other places of our body, they become weaker over time. And so the same thing happens in the pelvis. Another cause of not being able to control your stool is actually the opposite of what you think. It's, it's constipation. But because the stool is so packed in there and so hard the only thing that can come through is the liquidy stuff so then that's hard to control so actually for some people if you treat constipation you can control your bowels better and we know that controlling hard stool is easier than liquid stool and there are other causes of leakage as well like fistula and inflammatory bowel disease so the most important thing here is that at the time of delivery, if there is an injury to the anal sphincter, it must be fixed because that is your opportunity to heal and have that sphincter that's separated to be fixed and heal properly so that you can have control of your stool. So it's important to teach our residents who are the future OBGYNs doing deliveries to really be able to recognize when this injury has happened and to fix it right away. And of course, this goes for midwives and family doctors too, that you want this repaired at the time. So this is an example of our uh, session that we did for our residents here uh, at the lowest hole. And these are pig bottoms that we practice on with sphincter injuries. And if you are more interested about, if you are interested in donating to our residency fund or want to just learn more about it, please go to this QR code. So the sweet spot is to eat or take in 25 to 35 grams of fiber per day. The reason is because if it's too loose or too 
hard, you're going to have problems. Unfortunately, the average North American diet might eat 10 grams of fiber per day. So you actually have to pick a couple days, Google everything you eat. You can just put one cup blueberries or one piece of toast. And then you put the word fiber and a little table comes up and it tells you how much fiber is in what you ate. Of course, if you have the nutritional label, that's great too. But make sure you're eating between 25 and 35 grams of fiber per day. And if you're not, and it's very challenging, you might need fiber supplements. But with fiber goes water. If you just have one, it's not going to do anything. You need the water to help move things along. So again, at least a liter and a half of water per day. Do not strain. If you are pushing to have a bowel movement or you're pushing to pee, this is very bad. Because first of all, it'll give you hemorrhoids. It'll make any prolapse worse. And you're training your bowel and your bladder not to want to work on their own. So you're actually reinforcing this bad habit that I'll do the work for you. You don't have to. The key is to have your knees above your hips. Again, the American toilet is wrong uh, because you need to be in a position where your knees are above your hips. So whether you use uh, a little stool under your feet, that's probably the best. That will allow the muscle around the anal opening to be open enough that you can have a good bowel movement without straining. Of course, if that's not working, there are medications and there are surgeries. I put stars beside physiotherapy because, I'm sure you're getting sick of me saying this, but pelvic physiotherapy for fecal incontinence is our number one most successful procedure or, or intervention, I should say. Again, we have about 60-70% success that you won't have bowel accidents with pelvic physiotherapy. Surgery is a thumbs down. Our success rates are maybe 40% and infection rates are high uh, unless you do it in the moment with the vaginal delivery. <clears throat> but afterwards, it is not good. Because imagine afterwards, you're now going in and trying to cut out the nerve you're cutting out the sphincter to try to put it back together but you're cutting the nerves to be able to do that so you're actually making that control worse so prevention is important and of course staying on top of your diet is important and physiotherapy will go a long way okay in summary we learned some pelvic anatomy we learned about pelvic organ prolapse we reviewed what bladder incontinence and leakage is. We talked about bladder infections. We reviewed interstitial cystitis or bladder pain syndrome. We touched on chronic pelvic pain and its treatments. And we reviewed fecal incontinence and accidental bowel leakage. What are some takeaways here? Well, first of all, there is help if you are suffering. Our wait times are long but we are here. And if you feel like you cannot wait that long, I get it. But please seek out a pelvic physiotherapist. It is really good that there are several across the city and across the uh, province. So this is a really good place to start so that you can be ahead when it comes time to meeting with the surgeon, for example. I really do want to debunk any myths about vaginal estrogen. It is safe and should be used by almost anyone. We're, we're actually trying to change the uh, recommendations that you should start with a non-hormonal moisturizer first because vaginal estrogen is so safe and the dose is so low. A full year supply of vaginal estrogen is the same amount of estrogen as one quarter of one birth control pill. So it is not unsafe. It is not going to cause the problems that we know of potentially with other estrogen delivery systems. We've talked your ear off about pelvic floor physiotherapy. And start good bladder and pelvic habits early. This is an investment in your future. And those who work at it will see the results. And finally, this is the sad part, is due to lack of research care and care, women have turned to unconventional treatments, which can be at best ineffective and maybe as effective as placebo and at worst dangerous. 
And specifically, I'm talking about vaginal laser and the Imcella chair because these are considered research and experimental, and the studies have not shown benefit, and it is in our national guidelines that these are not best practice. But I understand when you're suffering and waiting, you will pay to try anything. So this is on us to find ways to make good care accessible. So what are the reputable websites? This is the Edmonton one. Be Pelvic Health Aware is a Canadian one. Voices for Pelvic Floor Disorders .org is American. And the International Urogynecology Association, their website is yourpelvicfloor.org. I'll leave these up for a moment. <clears throat> Our challenges are that historically women's health issues were not taught in medical school. So if we just say, oh, talk to your doctor about it. Yeah, but that didn't work because they didn't know what I was talking about or I was too shy and they didn't really engage with me. So that is a challenge we're working on. Our big challenge as a specialty is that there is no standard training across Canada when it comes to certain fields like urogynecology and pelvic health physiotherapy. So if you are a patient in Ontario versus Alberta, you're going to get different treatment for the same thing, probably. And therapies that can make a big difference are not always accessible to all Canadians, like pelvic physiotherapy. It can be expensive. And unfortunately, in BC, group therapy for physiotherapy is no longer covered by certain insurance providers. And that is really a shame because for pelvic floor after deliveries, we have studies that show it's as good as one-on-one -on -one after your first assessment, which is up to 75% improvement, improvement compared to only 5 to 15% improvement if you try to do your Kegels on your own. So th this access to pelvic physiotherapy is huge, especially if it can prevent surgery and future pelvic floor disorders in the future. So what are we doing about it? This is why we have the Canadian Society for Pelvic Medicine. We are a group of urogynecologists and pelvic physiotherapists across the country who are working to standardize our curriculum, standardize training, have excellence of care for all Canadian women. We're working with medical schools to rework the curriculum. Why is women's health just in their OBGYN teaching? Aren't there women in every aspect of medicine? So we're trying to get the curriculum changed so that Women's health is in all aspects of medicine and research. And that's where the Lois Hole Foundation has been so helpful and where ideas to advance how we care for you is happening right here in the clinic. We are advocating for you. And now we are asking you to advocate. So amazingly, the Edmonton Zone Medical Staff Association choose a certain health priority every year. And this year, it's women's health. And what they ask, they're asking us to do is to go to prioritizemyhealth.ca and write letters to government. And there are letters so you can, it's easy, you can see the health topics. And this is our year to really put women's health first. And so I urge you and everyone you know to take a moment to consider visiting this website, prioritizemyhealth.ca. And finally, if you want to come have fun with us, our clinic, we have a booth at the TELUS World of Science, Science of Sex. We get to talk about the anatomy part. Very important, very fun. So you're all more than welcome to buy tickets and come to the March 7th event at the TELUS World of Science. And that is my talk. And I'm so excited to read your questions and hear from Brianna about how we uh, can answer some of your thoughts and um I'll just end on this note that, of course, if you're looking to donate to the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society, that would be incredible. And we have the Royal Alexandra Hospital Foundation and the Lois Hole Hospital Foundation. Uh, we do have a urogynecology priority needs fund. Thank you all so much. And I'll pass it to Brianna. Thank you so much. I I feel like this has been so informative, and uh, we have so many questions. And I uh, I have done my best um, to kind of amalgamate them so that we can have a continued conversation. But everyone, please feel free if you do have more questions to that come up, 
please feel free to pop them into the Q&A chat and I will do my best um, to, to synthesize those for us. So I think a theme that came up several times as you were speaking um, was navigating the referral process to your clinic um, and navigating that aspect of advocacy for oneself um, if symptoms are potentially being dismissed by a healthcare provider. Um, and how would you suggest or can you suggest a way to uh, navigate that side of things? And, and then if you could also just review the referral process so patients understand how they could access um, the clinic. Absolutely. I, I wish I had a magical family doctor or a primary care, care provider for everyone who uh, understood your health needs. Um, so some of you do have that, which is great, because if you do, they are an excellent point person to start talking with. And hopefully, if you make an appointment specifically for this health concern, it will be recognized as a serious impact to your life. Um, so the, a referral must come from a physician, a family physician, and they refer to our clinic. But we also have three other urogynecologists in the city. Um, so it doesn't have to be in our clinic. We have 10 in the city, which is amazing. Um, but that would be the first thing. If you're having trouble with that, it is possible and it is challenging to navigate sometimes, but you can take your concern to a walk-in clinic and ask for help for a mm -hmm. referral. But unfortunately, it is referral-based, so you do need that in order to access the clinic. But what I'm hoping is that if you feel like there's a chance that physiotherapy can help you, start there because a lot of times you see us, the surgeon, and we say, have you tried physio? And you think, nah, I don't know. I just want you to fix it. It doesn't really work that way. There is no fix that's guaranteed and there's risks. So try the physio. And then the patient tries the physio. Oh, I don't need your help anymore. Perfect. So I really give it a shot. That is a direct access self-referral. You call the clinic, you Google pelvic physiotherapy, and you see which one's in your area. That would be something that I would highly recommend. And with finding a pelvic floor physiotherapist, because a few people have asked this question as well, do you have any advice as to how to find, like other than Google and, and sort of, you know, reading practitioner bios and getting a, a sense of who they are and how they practice in their training, just to your point of like lack of standardization of training for pelvic floor physiotherapists and uh, is there a way or a resource to navigate um, finding someone who might be a good fit? You know what? In our clinic, we have a list of physiotherapists that we recommend because we either know mm -hmm. them or uh, they've trained uh, more than just uh, some. Unfortunately, you can say you're a pelvic physiotherapist if you've just done a weekend course. And same with mm -hmm. your gynecologist. You can say you're your gynecologist and not have done extra too much extra training. So this is our challenge mm -hmm. that we are working on. But we do have a list of these physiotherapists. So I'm going to work with my group and we're going to put it on our Edmonton website so that that awesome. list can be accessed by everyone. Also, the Canadian Society for Pelvic Medicine has a Find My Provider section. And again, we're all of these are very young societies, so we're just getting all this started. So not everyone is there, but these uh, mm -hmm. websites will have, and I'm going to make myself a little note, that our list that we give all our patients of reputable and accessible physios in the Alberta area and if you're a physio listening to this and you want to be on the list, contact us. But we will put that on our edmontonurogynecology.com, uh, sorry, .ca, I believe. So um, give me a few days. By the end of the week, we'll have it there. But That's a really quick turnaround. Thank you. <laughs> you know, ask questions. If you have pelvic pain and all you're doing is learning Kegels, that doesn't make sense. If no one's ever done an internal examination... That doesn't make sense. So these are some tips like when you meet your physiotherapist, you can ask them, what is your experience? What is your training? They'd be happy to tell you um, because the ones who are dedicated, my gosh, they are amazing. And they'd be so excited mm -hmm. to tell you about how they can help you. 100%. And I think that that speaks to a question that was asked about pelvic floor physiotherapy. Typically, there is an internal exam involved in that process. Now, maybe not always on the first visit, but right. likely if we're trying to get a full assessment. 
Yes. And we do have patients who have a history of maybe sexual trauma, for example, or a reason why an mm -hmm. internal examination is just not possible at the beginning. So that doesn't mean that there isn't work to do. Posture, breathing, how we hold our pelvis, these things, mm -hmm. changing these things can still help our pelvic floor health. So even if you're not ready for an internal examination right away, don't think that a pelvic physiotherapist can't help you. They definitely can. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. And and people are post post uh, posting some of the links um, in the Q and A box oh, as good. well. If you're missing links here, but um, I also had a request. A few few patients requested. Could you put that um, slide back up that had the four different links? I think it had your yes. um, the the yeah. I think people are just. Um, yeah, this one, I think uh, folks wanted to just uh, maybe take a quick picture of that or, or access those Absolutely. resources. Um, to the continue the discussion on pelvic floor physiotherapy, there are a few specific questions, and I think you alluded to this a little bit at the end of, of your presentation about different like automated key goal sort of situations. We're talking chairs, we're talking like insertable ball things that have an app or a program and like so hot on Instagram right now. Um, or maybe that's just me because I had a baby two and a half years ago and they're like, you probably need pelvic floor. And I'm like, I get the ads too. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So it's not just me, but now no. that we're talking about it. They're going to show up more, right? Cause our phones are listening. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, can you speak to those sort of, um, there's one that keeps coming up, Eurospot and that kind of thing. Can you speak to that, those uh, at, at yes. all? Yes. Um, I was kind of alluding to this where I said, I understand why people are desperate and want mm -hmm. to try anything. Um, we actually had a really in-depth, uh, what we call a journal club, where we take all the research that's being done on a topic and presented amongst our colleagues. And we did that on the Eurospot Amsella chair and um, sorry, mm -hmm. the Eurospot is the clinic. They offer many other things, not just the chair, but we did our journal club on the chair. And at this point, it seems that there might be some promise, but there mm -hmm. is no evidence to show any long-term effect. So my patients who've done it say maybe it worked for a month, but it's expensive. It's thousands of dollars. So how often can you repeat that? Um, but some people want to try it. And of course, go ahead. My problem is the patients who come and say it caused me pain. And that's because if you have a tight pelvic floor and you should be doing rever reverse Kegels and then you're doing a thousand Kegels and now you're having a pain crisis. So I'm leery. I understand mm -hmm. that as healthcare providers in Canada, as physicians, we are, we have dropped the ball in women's health. And so people will turn to anything and anything that sounds like it might help them. So I, I don't blame mm -hmm. people at all, but I want you to be very careful uh, and manage your expectations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, and I think that's a really interesting point about like the relaxation. I love how you even said like when you're doing a Kegel, you have to relax your pelvic floor for the same uh, amount, uh, double the amount of time. Yes. Um, and there were some questions just specifically about like, there were folks that were like, I don't know if I'm doing it right. How do I know if I'm doing a Kegel right? And I don't know if I can hold a, a Kegel for more than a second. Like, am I supposed to be able to do that? So- Okay, let's I, do it together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can everyone sit in their chair with their feet flat on the ground, get comfy. And if you can't, don't panic because only 25% of people can do a Kegel without having one-on-one -on -one instruction or coaching. So it's, it's more mm -hmm. common not to be able to do one, but let's try. So I want you to first see if your bum is clenched. If it is, unclench it. And just try to let your, your muscles in your legs go as much as you can. And the first thing I want you to imagine is that you're about to pee and you're going to stop yourself from peeing. And just imagine that motion and let that go. For some people, they can do that. And that's a squeeze of the muscles around the urethra, which is the vaginal Kegel. And that is a Kegel. Some people with that cube doesn't help. So what you can instead imagine, so let's start again, get comfy. Imagine that there is a 
soft piece of spaghetti just sitting at the edge of your vagina and you're going to slurp it up and suck it into your vagina all the way up. So you're going to imagine that you're taking or picking up something with your pelvic floor and picking it all the way up. And if that doesn't work, let's start again. Shake it out. Shake out your bum muscles. The next one is to imagine you're in a very important, I don't know, meeting or where you are and you're about to pass wind and you really don't want to. How are you going to hold your gas in? Squeeze. Now that's your external anal sphincter. But for some people, they know how to do that. But because the Kegel muscle is close to it, you're contracting a bit of those muscles and it, at least it'll start that mind-body connection. Like some people can wiggle their ears. Others can't. But if you've never done it, it's hard. Your mind has never made that body connection. So if you've never done a Kegel, it's hard to just do it by thinking about it. But there are these kind of cues. And when you have one of those apps that they want you to put in, you want to put in the vagina and the app tells you what you do. I, I think some of those might be fine. They give you a bit of feedback. We call it biofeedback. A lot of physios mm -hmm. use it. So you're getting mm -hmm. real time information about what your muscles are doing if they're squeezing. Um, so that could be something. Or again, a coach, a human physical therapist will give you that feedback if you are doing the right muscle. Awesome. Well, I think hopefully some of us got some practice there. Um, and and if not, um, we'll uh, we'll wait with bated breath for your list of uh, pelvic PTs. Yes. Um, and there was another question about other parts of Alberta, and I think that's a great question. I know there is a newly um, created Alberta Physiotherapy Association just for physiotherapists in general. Of course, they have the regulatory body, which is the college, but then the association provides more information about the um, practitioners themselves. So that might be something to punch into Google. But do you have any other ideas about accessing physiotherapists in, you know, Red Deer, Calgary, Wigminster, like, you know? Right. Our, um, our list is for all of Northern Alberta and surrounding oh, areas. Fantastic. So it, it'll cover quite a large area. A good chunk. Uh, we have a satellite yeah. clinic of our urogynecology clinic in Edson. Um, so we are familiar with the pelvic physiotherapist that way. And uh, mm -hmm. our list is pretty comprehensive. It doesn't include Southern Alberta, but I don't think that applies to most of us. Okay. And if, and if, if you are in Southern Alberta, I think we'll, we'll, you know, hope that you can access the association as a resource and, um, or somebody that's close by from our, from our list that's coming. So thank you for that. Um, a very specific question about hypopressives. Um, do you think that hypopressives, um, which are a type of breathing technique, uh, just for the participants that might not know, but uh, do you find there's value in those or is that something that you would, you know, kind of rely on? A, 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 and I think the question is specific to prolapse, um, hypopressives for prolapse. Yeah. Um, I know that we do have physiotherapists who do use this technique and it is helpful for some patients with prolapse. Um, so I, I think that it is a good tool for some patients, but again, I would defer to that one-on-one -on -one sort of assessment mm -hmm. to know if that is uh, right for you, but if it's helping, please. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Do more. Awesome. Um, I, I am also trying to respond to some of these questions as they're oh, coming yes. in just with like, so sorry, I'm, I'm doing my best here to, to kind of uh, synthesize all of this, but um, okay, let's stay on kind of pelvic floor and postpartum for a minute. Um, a few questions came in specifically about postpartum. Okay. Um, one about uh, uh, vaginal delivery after an injury or a uh, rectal injury, do we think that another vaginal delivery is still a good idea? Do we want to advocate for a cesarean section? Um, and and then also leading into a question around, does, do we think that pelvic floor physiotherapy should be part of our antenatal and postpartum or prenatal and postpartum care um, with respect to does that does that prevent or does that do we think that that has any benefit for preventing prolapse or or injury that way yes and yes 
So mm -hmm. I definitely believe that, again, women's health has been um, neglected. Like if you get, uh, if, when I had my ankle surgery, I had seven physiotherapy sessions covered. If you have carpal tunnel release, you have four physiotherapy sessions covered. If you have vaginal delivery, zero. If you have mm -hmm. pelvic prola prolapse surgery, zero. This is really bad. Um, so I definitely think that it is important during pregnancy and after pregnancy uh, to be in touch with your pelvic floor physiotherapist because there is external work that you can do during pregnancy to prepare and there is definitely work to be done afterwards. Um, in terms of the question about cesarean section, if you've had a previous injury, we used to not really think about that. And um, the studies that are coming out are probably within the last 10 years. And this is where we see it's actually definitely worth a discussion because if you've had one serious injury, whether it's an anal sphincter injury, which would be the most severe, would be a fourth degree tear, or if you already have mm -hmm. fecal incontinence, or if you have bladder incontinence, which has not improved, um, if there's already prolapse, it is 100% a good idea to talk to your OBGYN about an elective cesarean section. And, you know, our, our mentality has been for years that, oh, vaginal, natural, this is really good. This is all, what we should do. But at what cost do we really mm -hmm. know the risks? And if you've already had this injury, for some, if you already had it, they feel like, well, it can't get worse. I'll I'm okay with another vaginal delivery, but it depends on the person. And so it is definitely worth a conversation. And I would say every OBGYN now will offer cesarean section to prevent worsening of a sphincter injury or a pelvic mm -hmm. injury. So it's definitely worth talking about. But definitely something to raise with your with your OBGYN um, if you're pregnant and, and um, nearing that, uh, that due date. Um, the other theme um, that came in was about vaginal estrogen, but also other vaginal products. So okay. things like the vaginal estrogen, there's so many questions like, it, can I use it after breast cancer? Should I use it preventively if I um, don't really have any vaginal symptoms, but I am peri or postmenopausal? Um, questions about the vaginal DHEA inserts or um, intra, intra rosa, I think it's called, um, and or hyaluronic acid, and sort of looking at the variety of of inserts or moisturizers or things that are available. And then also, yeah, those questions around um, vaginal estrogen, uh, specifically with respect to breast cancer and then prevention if you're not symptomatic in any way. Okay. So we used to say that if you have had breast cancer yourself, or if you have had blood clots, maybe you shouldn't be getting any estrogen, extra estrogen from any source. So that's where that, you know, question when people would prescribe vaginal estrogen, they would ask, oh, have you had breast cancer? And then people would say, no, but my sister did, or my family member did. So first step we learned is that family history, definitely safe. And now only, I'd say in the past five years, have we learned that if you yourself have had breast cancer, it is still completely safe if you take it vaginally again i'm not talking about the oral pill or the patch mm -hmm. or the um systemic hormone that goes through mm -hmm. your whole body so there's been studies where they take the blood of someone who's on vaginal estrogen and someone who's not and the estrogen levels in like pico moles or the such a low dose they're the same so you can't actually tell a difference between those on or off vaginal estrogen and then we had a huge study come out of Europe just last month in a big medical journal called JAMA <clears throat> that had mm -hmm. 50,000 patients. And they followed these 50,000 patients who had breast cancer who were on va vaginal estrogen, and they did not have a higher recurrence rate than though, uh, of their breast cancer than those who were not on estrogen. So we've had mm -hmm. study after study confirm that even if you've had breast cancer, it is safe. And it can be life-changing. My mm -hmm. own family member 
was getting bladder infection after bladder infection, but because she had breast cancer, she did not want to go on estrogen. But when she did, her her infection stopped and her quality mm-hmm. of life is so much better. So I would definitely encourage um, that and not to be afraid mm-hmm. of the vaginal estrogen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's my breast cancer answer. Uh, in terms of, now, if you're peri or postmenopausal, but you don't have symptoms... So one of the nurses in our clinic actually said, you know, I think I'm fine, but I'm kind of curious. And I, you know, I have been in menopause for years. Uh, Can you prescribe me some vaginal estrogen? No, the proper channel is that you need a referral from your family doctor. Just kidding. I did give it to her. Don't tell anyone. Um, She said, wow, I didn't realize all these problems I had (laughs) until I didn't have them anymore. I can pee straight now. Things feel better. I don't have that burning feeling when I have intercourse, like all these things that you just kind of slowly get used to, but that's just low estrogen uh, in the vagina. So if you're after menopause, because of how safe it is, I feel like if you have any symptoms or you feel like there is a need, I think it's safe to try. Um, There are many different delivery systems. So there's a pill that comes on a stick that you insert vaginally that you do twice a week if you have a uterus mm-hmm. three times a week if you don't um, that's called Vagifem. there's two creams on the market one's called premarin one's called estragine and again those can be inserted in the vagina with your finger or with a stick an applicator and then there's a ring that that can give off the bits of estrogen that you just put in the vagina and you change once every three months Uh, That's called an E-string. And then finally, there's the new product on the market called Intrarosa or Prasterone, which is actually not estrogen. It's the precursor, so the hormone called DHEA, that converts Mm -hmm. to estrogen and testosterone. But it's, I think, pretty cool because it's a science out of Montreal that it uses Mm -hmm. a technology called intrachronology. So the only cells that can convert the DHEA to testosterone and estrogen are vaginal cells. So it can't go anywhere else in the body. So people who have breast cancer feel Mm -hmm. even more comfortable being on that maybe. And if there's any bit of sexual dysfunction, so anything that you think maybe Mm -hmm. having some testosterone for would be helpful, DHEA might be a good choice. That one's suspended in, it looks like a little bullet. It feels like a crayon. It's um, palm and coconut oil. And then the DHEA comes from yams. So that can be a vegan option as well. Did I answer? Was there one more? Was there one more part to that? Uh, no, but that is really cool. Thank you for explaining that. Um, just the fact that the vaginal cells are can convert DHEA yes. into estrogen and Amazing. testosterone is mm-hmm. fascinating. Um, do you the the last bit? Uh, the other topical or or intravaginal was um a hyaluronic acid. Oh, right. Um, Hyaluronic acid, especially because our previous recommendations, or I guess they're still current, were to always start with non-hormonal, just we Mm -hmm. always start with, you know, the simple stuff. Hyaluronic Mm -hmm. acid-based vaginal moisturizers are one of the options. And for some people, it's great. That's all they need. They just need some extra moisture and they're, they're good. So Mm -hmm. even though I'm a big fan, can you tell, of vaginal (laughs) acid? If you're doing well on other non-hormonal options, that's great. You can definitely carry on. Um, And just because we're still on this topic and the questions just keep coming, um, (laughs) do you, um, if you're on estrogel, assuming with progesterone or some kind of uterine protection, um, can you use uh, vaginal estrogen as well? Great question. Absolutely, yes. Um, guess where is the only part of the body that systemic estrogen doesn't reach the vagina. So even if you're on a pretty high dose of hormone replacement therapy, which I don't mean to say that can be so helpful for so many patients, women going through menopause. So it's not to say that it's scary and risk and everything for the right patient. It's the perfect treatment. Um, 
but it just doesn't, it's just not enough really to get to the vagina. So yes, we definitely have patients on both. But again, because we're just learning this, some pharmacists will be like, what? Why are you? No, this is not safe. Mm -hmm. um, and in mm -hmm. Canada, we have something called class labeling. So because estrogen mm -hmm. is in the class of estrogen, even if it's vaginal, it'll still have a, on your little uh, monogram box that you get, it'll say risks and it'll list everything like the blood clots, the, the breast cancer. But again, I promise you that the studies are solid. It's different if it's administered vaginally, but you can do both. That is safe because it's so low of a dose vaginally. Um, and yeah, because it doesn't, the systemic estrogen doesn't make its way to the vagina and the vaginal estrogen doesn't make its way to the, exactly. the rest of the body. So <laughs> what a mystery. Um, okay, just because we only have two minutes left, mm. I'm going to open a can of worms um, and ask about rectocele or rectal prolapse. Um, there were several questions that came in uh, along those lines. Um, one was about advocating for surgery. Um, one was just sort of, can you discuss this a little bit? Um, and uh, so since we have one minute, I'll yes, give okay. you a rect seal. <laughs> Okay, Brianna, I'm so so bad. I got really distracted by the chat. The question is rectocele and do I recommend surgery? It's 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 do you recommend surgery? How can you advocate for surgery if you've been waiting for a really long time? There's people that have been waiting and, and supposed to have surgery and, and are having symptoms. And I think also just generally could you speak to rectocele um and your experience with, oh, sure. with treatment? Yes. Um Okay, so rectocele is uh, the term for the posterior vaginal prolapse. So there's three compartments to the prolapse or to the vagina. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to the front picture and all three can prolapse or just one or the other. So some people just have a rectocele. So the middle one is a cystocele. So that means it's the bladder side. So anterior vaginal prolapse, but we can just pretend this was posterior. It could look exactly like this. So it's the bulge, but it comes from the back wall. So we treat them all similar when it comes surgically. Um, and that is that we make an incision right in the middle here. We open the skin. We find the tough tissue underneath called fascia. We sew that back together. We trim away the extra skin that is stretched. And then we sew this back together. And rectocele surgery is actually more successful than cystocele surgery. So the front wall of the vagina likes to prolapse again um, at a higher rate than the back wall probably because we have the muscles there that we can use for support in the back wall, but we don't have those same mm. palpable muscles on the front wall. Um, so that's how we do what we call a posterior vaginal repair and anterior vaginal repair. When the very top of the vagina, either where the cervix, uterus, or where the uterus used to be, like this picture where the person's already had a hysterectomy, then we start to get a little bit more complicated as to the options of how to suspend if you're older, like for our ladies who are 80 years plus uh, or 90 years plus, there's also a vaginal closure surgery where we just close the opening so no prolapse can come through. It's a much faster surgery, better recovery, but intercourse is not possible after. So it's for mm -hmm. people who know that they will not use their vagina in that way anymore. But um, mm -hmm. is the one minute up, how to get more yeah. surgeries. Um help us uh, the canadian yeah. society for pelvic medicine we're getting the physicians organized next we're going to have patient advocates um, write the letters please um and just keep talking to everyone about it let's not keep this a taboo because the more mm -hmm. people realize that we need these surgeries uh the more access mm -hmm. uh, hopefully we will get to them Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much for and for that last advocacy piece, because that's so, so important. And so that website was prioritizemyhealth.ca where you can do some some yes. letter writing. And then, of course, there's also the Canadian Society for, for Pelvic Medicine. Um, and and then, uh, of course, the clinic um, at the Louisville Hospital for Women, which is what the Women's Society, one of the many resources at the Louisville Hospital for Women that the Women's Society works uh, to support. Um, so thank you to all of you for attending here today. Um, I am just going to do a quick screen share here with, with yet another QR code. Um, this is our favorite thing. Uh, just to, uh, to, uh,
uh, invite anyone here to be who is not a current monthly supporter to join our squad, become a monthly supporter for the Lois Hill Hospital for Women um, and our Women's Society. Uh, your support advances care in such a meaningful direction and helps to support clinics um, and technology and research. And um, it's just such such an important cause to me and my family. Um, I want to thank Alberta Blue Cross, Trish, uh, from the bottom of my heart for your sponsorship for this series. And of course, um, Dr. May, thank you so much. Such a great candid conversation. I love chatting with you. Um, and, and I think our participants learned so, so much from you. Um, this talk does get posted to our YouTube channel within a couple of days um, after, after the webinar, um, but you will also receive a survey, um, like um, was mentioned in the intro video. Um, and if you complete that feedback survey, you will be entered to win a $25 um, gift card courtesy of Alberta Blue Cross. So when you win, it's not a scam. You really did win something. Um, but please fill out that feedback um, form if you have time. Um, your feedback is how we tailor these talks. We really take it seriously. We read every single one of your comments and we appreciate it so much. So join um, the monthly supporter uh, campaign if you can if you can make a monthly donation and be part of our women's society we would love that fill out our feedback form and uh, stay tuned for our next session coming up in February um, where we will be talking about heart health so thank you again Dr. May thank you everyone thank for you being for here having tonight. me and we'll see you all again soon good night